help Eleanor come home. This is a No Fear podcast. We know what scares you. Hi, I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 25 in season three, our last episode before we move into our fourth season. If you've joined us this summer, then you know we've been watching Netflix's The Haunting of Hill House. This episode, we thought we'd take a look at the movie versions of Shirley Jackson's novel, specifically Robert Wise's 1963, The Haunting. Okay, so listeners, um, as you can tell from our introduction from Shirley Jackson's book, The Haunting of Hill House, and Lisa telling you we're getting ready to talk about Robert Wise's The Haunting. We're still kind of continuing our summer of Shirley beyond the Netflix television show, which we've been discussing for the past month or so. Um, And I'm sure you guys also noticed from the intro that Matt was unable to be with us for recording this evening. Uh, So you have me and you have Lisa, but you also have a special guest. So tonight we are joined by Sherry, uh, who is an expert in Charles Dickens. I think it's safe to say that. Also the Gothic. (laughs) And you write about film studies as well. Um, And she has been on the show before. So I think it's the one episode that we have played twice. So the first Christmas episode we ever did was about Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. And Sherry joined us for that discussion. And then the next uh, Christmas, our second Christmas, we re-ran that episode because we just enjoyed it so much and we learned so much about it. Um, I guess in the interest of full disclosure, uh, Sherry and I used to be colleagues, so we taught at the same institution, and Lisa and I actually edited a collection on Shirley Jackson that included a very fine essay that Sherry wrote about this movie, so we are very excited to hear your thoughts, Sherry. We, I think we're, it's safe to say, guys, we're going to ignore the 1999 version of The Haunting <laughs> and just pretend that it never I, happened. I, 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 <laughs> a little bit to say about that one that one's interesting as a cultural artifact but as a movie it is god awful so um (laughs) avoid that one if you yeah that i feel like anytime someone describes it as a cultural artifact it has to be bad That's its only value is a cultural <laughs> artifact. <laughs> but but anyway, thank you for having me back. Um, I've really been enjoying the episodes you guys have been doing this summer on uh, the Netflix series, um, and I I loved that series as well. Um, I had some of the issues, same issues that you guys had with it in terms of adaptation, um, where sometimes it would kind of. Uh, Uh, choose its Easter eggs kind of randomly from Jackson's text. But for the most part, I thought it was a really good, a a really creative reworking of a lot of the themes from uh, Jackson's novel, even though it is a a remarkably loose adaptation. It's not by any means close to the novel. And the um, movie that we're going to talk about tonight, the 1963 adaptation directed by Robert Wise, I think is a, a closer adaptation. So it'll be interesting to think about in comparison um, to the Netflix series that you've been talking about. Yeah, my take on the 1963 The Haunting is that, well, one, I like it better than 1999 um, version because it is closer. Uh, The first time I watched it, I loved it just as a movie. I know it's on a lot of top 10, top 20 horror movie lists. Um, the end kind of threw me off a little bit because of the way they felt like they had to interpret the journey's end and lovers meeting and the incorporation of Montague's wife and the way they did it. But for the most part, I think the cool shots of the house and the way they try to focus on Eleanor, the way they try to use the monologues like the book, which I'm sure we'll talk about, those aspects have always made me have a, a place in my heart for this particular version can I say something about how I first saw this film? Um, sure. It, uh, I saw it when I was a kid. And, and if we're thinking about adaptations, at the time I saw this, I did not know it was an adaptation of a novel. I was, I was just a kid. And um, I grew up in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And 
there was a local station, uh, WREG TV, that in the 70s and 80s had the largest collection of feature films of any television station in the United States. And they would play uh, films in the afternoons, um, late at night, starting at 1030 after the evening news. They were, I think, a CBS affiliate, but all the time that they weren't playing network programming, they would be playing films from their film collection. So I grew up watching day and night um, a, a lot of classic films from this station. And every Sunday, our local paper would publish um, a movie guide for the movies that they would be playing on TV that week. And they would give a four star rating, you know, for each movie is at rank it out of four stars. And I would look ahead of time every week to see which movies were coming up. And I'd try to watch the ones that were like ranked four stars. And I saw on a Halloween night, this movie called The Haunting was going to play in the late, late night. It was either at 1030 or midnight. Um, and it had a four star rating and so my brother and i stayed up and it may have even been a school night and so we may have snuck it and stayed up on halloween night to watch this thing and it scared the crap out of us <laughs> 1963 black and white film you know when we were kids that were used to big special effects of star wars you know and and stuff like that and um this movie was so uh, i guess it was an exercise in restraint as to how to suggest, create horror through suggestion um, rather than through uh, uh, incredible special effects, which is what unfortunately the 1999 movie tried to do. It was just overblown spectacle. And it showed what you could do with effective camera work and cinematography with, with lighting um, and set design as well as great performances to just suggest the horror and really frighten people and and this became i think one of if not my favorite horror film um because of that first experience in in watching it kind of on the sly late at night um when we were kids so uh, i think it's a real good example of how less is more in filmmaking um it, many times and uh it uses that kind of restraint to get at some of the horror aspects of themes from the novel as well through a fairly close adaptation, although there are those significant changes that um, Mel just mentioned, especially towards the end of the film. Uh, Lisa, how did you encounter this movie? Did, let me ask you guys this question. Since it's an adaptation, did you read the novel first and then see the movie, or did you see the movie before you read the novel? Sherry, I'm so glad you just told that story and just asked that question <laughs> um, <laughs> because I grew up in Memphis too and I know exactly the um, the TV shows that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly, because I think that was my, that may have been, I don't remember staying up late at night, um, but I remember seeing this movie as a child on television. So it had to have been on the same channel. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And here's the thing is I, I've talked about this before. As a child, I was scared of everything. I was scared of my own shadow. Um, and so the thought of a, of a horror movie or a scary movie, you know, I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't even go to Blockbuster and, and walk past the horror section because I was afraid of the images on the VHS covers. <laughs> um, but my grandmother and I used to sit together and watch old Vincent Price movies. And so I kind of had it in my head that black and white horror movies were safe for me to watch. Uh -huh. And, and so I was not afraid of those. And I remember, oh gosh, this is so funny. Um, in fact, you mentioned the newspaper, and this is kind of a side anecdote. Um, I used to read those too in the newspaper. In fact, when I was in junior high, they let me write a kid's version for a few months where, oh. <laughs> where I, I rated, uh, rated like kids' movies for a while. Um, I, we did it somehow through school. It was like a library program, but it was, it was the most fun I've had <laughs> um, getting to do that. But I saw this movie when I was probably way too young to see it. 
And I thought it was going to be okay because I thought it was going to be closer to like the House of Wax, Vincent Price type movies, which are scary, but also kind of fun. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was ex- expecting with this one. And I remember being terrified. <laughs> Ter- like to this day, that scene where, sh- you know, the- just something about the the big heavy wooden doors and um, the knocking. Oh, I- yeah. I- I- I've never <laughs> been so so frightened of sound effects in a movie before. Um, and, and I mean, just terror from head to toe. And so I did not watch this movie again until I was an adult because it frightened me so (laughs) badly, (laughs) but I was like you, I did not realize it was based on a book until I didn't, I didn't really find Shirley Jackson until I was in college. And then I didn't start reading her prolifically until I was out of college. So I was an adult when I found her work and So it took me that long to go back and reread it and realize I love Shirley Jackson to go back and watch the movie just because of the traumatic experience I I had with it. And it's still, it's still, when we talk about it, I love this movie so much, but I get goosebumps up and down, up and down. Like as you were telling the story of watching it late at night, you know, kind of staying up and it's this illicit thing. It... I, I it does it sends chill chills up and down my spine, um, which in I think night, is a, yes, in the dark it, at Halloween. <laughs> it, it's such an effective it's such an effective um, movie in that way, and I think that's one of the reasons why it has endured for so long. Um, and those four stars were well deserved, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, Mel, um, Mel, did you read the book first or, or see the film first? Uh, my story is not as cool as either of yours. <laughs> um, I, I knew Shirley Jackson uh, when I was in, I guess, middle school and high school because of the lottery. And then in 1999, when the movie was coming out, I think I was at a Barnes and Noble and I happened to see The Haunting of Hill House face out on a shelf and it had the movie tie-in cover. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, oh, this looks interesting, like a haunted house book. Um, I didn't think of myself as a horror fan per se, because I was reading, I read a ton of mysteries and sci-fi and fantasy when I was a kid. And I read some stuff that was more about like hauntings and ghosts and stuff. And I thought, I'll pick this up and read it. And I read the book and I just loved it. It creeped me out and I loved the writing that kind of got me started off on reading more Shirley Jackson, but I didn't end up seeing the 1999 movie. I wasn't sure about it when I saw the trailer. And so I ended up renting the 1963, the haunting because uh-huh. I wanted to see that adaptation. So that this is the first movie I watched, even though oddly the 1999 movie coming out was kind of what caught my attention um, to initially read the book. But yeah, so I agree with, you, with both of you on everything that you're saying about scariness. What were you going to say, Jerry? Your, your story kind of brings us back to the idea of adaptation. And, um, uh, all of our stories here, the kind of symbiotic relationship between film adaptations and their literary sources. And it runs both ways. Um, in my experience, quite often, if I, I see a film adaptation, I find out that it's based on a literary work. I want to go read that work. Or if I read a literary work and I find out there's going to be a film of it, I, I need to see the adaptation. And I think um, a- adaptations, uh, in one of your past episodes, when you were talking about the Netflix series, since it's such a loose adaptation, Mel said that adaptation isn't an exact science. And it, it certainly isn't. I mean, that's why it's called adaptation, you know, and I, I think one of the cool things about a film adaptation like The Haunting is that it it can bring people to the novel itself who weren't familiar with it, because whenever I later found out, I, I didn't look at the credits of the movie when I first saw it, but when I rewatched it later, um, when I was older and I saw that it was based on a novel, that's what took me to the novel. Um, so that got me reading Shirley Jackson, um, and I had already encountered the lottery in, in, uh, grammar school or high school. Um, but specifically I wanted to read that novel because of Robert Wise's film. 
Um, and often, you know, like uh, they say in marketing of, of films and novels that um, when a, a film adaptation comes out and is popular, often sales of the original novels based on will spike, you know. Um, so adaptations can kind of be ways of reanimating past texts, you know. I mean, the cinema is kind of like there's kind of the cinema is a kind of ghostly um, medium in the first place where it's reanimating the past for us. I mean, you got people that may be even long dead and gone or past places that have been incredibly changed and they come back to life in front of us on the screen um, through cinema. And I think cinema can also reanimate past texts like that for new cultures. And um, that's one of the things that I think is really interesting about adaptations is that they can, they can bring new life to past texts to address needs um, in different societies, different time periods, um, not only bringing past cultures to life, but bringing past texts to life for a contemporary society in a different way. And that's what I, I found interesting in that Netflix series is that it's, it seems to be taking a different approach to Jackson's material, even though it's getting a lot of the same themes um, from a more contemporary perspective. And I think the 1963, The Haunting, is doing the same thing. And in many ways, it, the changes that it makes or the adaptations that it makes in Jackson's narrative, I think, are really grounded in the time period when that film was made. Uh, so maybe we could talk about some of the changes a little bit later. I don't know. What, what do you guys want to talk about next with it? Well, you know, one thing I'm curious about, um, just because you brought it up when you were talking about your first viewing of the film and and how effective it is at conjuring terror <laughs> in the audience. Uh -huh. um, and it is one of these films that is it's really interesting because it's, it's a haunted house story. So it's a ghost story at its core, but it doesn't ever really show you a ghost yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that's one of the things that makes it it's superior to the newer version. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't it doesn't show you much and it leaves a lot of ambiguity. And there's a lot of the psychological horror that is so popular today where we get a lot of that ambiguous psychological horror. And this was made in 1963. So talk about something that was well ahead of its time. Yeah, but I'm really curious just from a film standpoint, what what were some of the things um, that Robert Wise did when he was making the film to enhance that sense of terror, especially since he doesn't show you any ghosts and he doesn't really show you much blood or anything really in the way of gore? Well, you think about that. Let me start first with how he got he got a hold of Jackson's book and the screenwriter that he he worked with because I think that will get into answers to your question. Um, he uh, if you look at one of the recent DVD versions of The Haunting, there's a great commentary track on there with Robert Wise and Nelson Gidding, who's the screenwriter, and Wise talks about coming across um, a review of Jackson's novel in Time Magazine that got him so interested in the novel, he went and got a copy of it, um, and he was reading it in his office while he was working on a film with Nelson, some other film with Nelson getting and getting barged into his office in the middle of some intense scene in the novel he was reading, and it made him, like, jump three feet out of his chair. It scared him, <laughs> and, and he said whenever he got scared like that, he knew the novel would make a great movie. And so he gave it to getting to try to develop a screen treatment. And I think you're talking about psychological drama. I think what's really interesting is that getting claims that when he read the novel, he interpreted it primarily as psychological, that it was a novel really about Eleanor's psychological breakdown so much. So to the point that he thought it could be interpreted as not a genuine ghost story at all, that maybe everything was occurring within Eleanor's mind. And he was so taken by this interpretation that he felt he had to go to Shirley Jackson to see if he was right. And he got with Wise and said, we need to meet with this novelist because I want to know, is this her intention? I want to be careful before I 
proceed with my screenplay. And so they met with Shirley Jackson and he, he asked her, is it possible to interpret it this way, that this is not supernatural at all, that this is all the, the disintegration of this woman's mind? And she said, uh, I think his exact quote was that, she said, that's a da- damn good idea, but that's not it. <laughs> That there is a supernatural element. There's at least some supernatural element to, to her story, it seems, what she was implying. And so we, it seems like the film kind of leaves us on that little hint of ambiguity where we're not sure to what degree what elements are supernatural and what elements are coming from the minds of the characters, especially from Eleanor, because they use a lot of voiceover narration uh, from Eleanor. In fact, I think almost all of it all voice over narration in the film, except for the very beginning narration that was provided by um, Dr. Mark Way, who is the the movie's uh, substitute for Dr. Montague, the psychic investigator. Um, he gives some narration at the beginning of the movie to, to tell the story of Hill House and the Crane family. But the rest of it comes from the mind of Eleanor as she's interacting with the other characters and the house. So to some degree, there are times where we're not sure what, aspects of the haunting are coming from her mind and what aspects are actually supernatural when she experiences things with other characters though like the, there are two nights in the house where she has those terrifying experiences with theo you remember that the first night they sleep there they hear the horrible noises the banging coming down the hallway coming to their door and then they both see the doorknob turning as if something is trying to come into their bedroom um, and then I think it's the second night they hear the the voice of some angry man pontificating, like sermonizing. It sounds like it's Hugh Crane, uh, who uh, uh, you can't actually hear the words. You can't tell what the words are, but it sounds like an angry man giving some kind of horrible sermon. And there's a child crying in response to it. Um, and all we get are these noises. Um, Robert Wise said that he actually had the noises recorded in advance and he played the soundtrack for the actors while they were performing so that they could hear what they were supposed to be reacting to. So they could hear the horror of the, the pounding thing coming down the hallway or the child weeping while the angry man is, is uh, pontificating at it. Um, so they would know how, how to respond. So you got sound. But there's still that aspect of the unknown. You don't see anything. You know, you don't see a ghost open the door. You don't see what's making the pounding noise. You never see an a angry man or a weeping child. The, at most, they see in that, that wonderful scene where they're hearing those voices, they look at the wall that the voices seem to come from. And Wise's camera focuses on patterns in the wall, and the patterns kind of seem to take on the appearance of faces, scared and then angry faces, but you're still not sure. You can't quite see. Um, so the, the cinematography uses light and shadows, I think with the black and white cinematography is especially effective, to kind of give you little hints of things that you can't fully see. And you've got to think about what... Um, what we're often most afraid of is what we can't see, you know, the, the noise that we don't know where it's coming from or the fear of the dark. Um, and I think about that second scene when Theo and um, uh, Eleanor are together in the bedroom and the, they're asleep with, in the dark and they wake up hearing the voice of the angry father character, it sounds like, in the child weeping. And that seems terrifying to me because the camera focuses on those weird kind of faces in the wall, and then it cuts to shots of Eleanor, who's just barely lit, she's just looking around the room trying to see things. And she hears these voices. She calls out to Theo, just take my hand, Theo. And she thinks she feels Theo take her hand, and they hold hands, she thinks, through all of this, trying to survive the terror of these voices. And then when the child begins to cry and Eleanor realizes this ghost may be harming a child, I can't stand that a child could could be harmed, she decides to fight back and, and she screams out, stop, stop. Theo turns on the light. Eleanor looks down and her hand is empty. Theo is all the way across the room from her. Eleanor is lying on the opposite side of the room and she looks at her open hand and says, 
whose hand was I holding? That to me is the most terrifying moment in the film. You know, it's, it's what you don't see. Um, and Wise, I think, got some of those techniques of, of implying, of suggestion um, from his mentor, uh, Val Luton. He was a, a producer um, in early Hollywood filmmaking and horror films um, who helped Wise, I think, on his own first horror film, Curse of the Cat People. Um, and Luton's idea was that you show nothing, you know, that people are more afraid of the unknown than, than of anything else. They're more afraid of the unknown than what they can see. So you, you be very careful and restrained in what you show, you imply. And so we get through, through photography, like, um, cinematography using, uh, careful use of shadow, light and dark use of, uh, weird camera angles because there's a whole lot of oblique camera angles, low camera angles, um, wide angle lens shots that are distorted in this film. Robert Wise even got a special um, camera lens from Panavision when he was making this. He wanted a, a 30 millimeter lens he felt wasn't wide enough for what he wanted to create something that was really distorted that gives you this sense of the huge corridors and rooms that these people are caught in. And so he went to the, the president of Panavision to try to get a wider lens. And um, he said that they had a new lens they were working on, but it created distortion. They couldn't get it to work right. It, it distorted the image. And he said, that's exactly what I need. <laughs> so he uses a lens to give us distorted images of what should be familiar spaces like parlors, hallways, staircases you know things like that where we don't actually have to see a ghost in those places to be terrified by them um and i think that's where production design also comes into the terror of this film because that the house just the way that it looks is often damn terrifying don't you think i mean what do you make of the house itself in this movie Oh, the, the house. I mean, <clears throat> until I saw the house in the Netflix version of The Haunting of Hill House, that house was like what was in my mind as, you know, uh, as Hill House with the tower and the not being able to place what year maybe it was made and the whole like long winding driveway. But also the way that they shot the different parts of the house, like, you know, when they see it from afar and the shadows and it's kind of creepy or the getting light on the house or getting dark on the house, the kind of jolting takes on the tower when Eleanor almost falls down because of the way yeah. that she's she's looking at it. I thought, you know, I actually had read that story that you were talking about with the, the distortion on the sides of the screen. And it made me think that it's so interesting how they tried to use that cinematography to parallel some of the features that Jackson talked about with the house in the book, it seems like, or even what we think of as scary in real life, right? Because often what we see out of the corner of our eye or what we see when we're off balance or if something is off balance and throws off, us off balance is what's creepy. Um, our brains try to make patterns. So seeing the pattern on the wall look like an angry face is of course going to make what you might be hearing seem way worse than it really is. And yeah. I love how the movie plays with, like we're already afraid of these sorts of things and the movie plays with it and, and enhances uh, enhances that fear, I think, in really interesting ways. I mean, one of the things that's scariest about Hill House in the book is that everything is off just enough so that you'll, you know, you go up the stairs and you almost fall down because you're constantly going slightly, even though you're going up, you're going slightly down because the stairs are all slightly kind of sloping or doors closed and that sort of thing. And they played with that, with those shots at the tower and people becoming unsettled um, and them getting lost. So, I, don't know, I think it's interesting how they try to, you know, from what you're saying, they tried to do things with stylistics. So the way they were shooting the film to become close to, you know, the fear that we would have in that kind of situation, the fear that Jackson was trying to create in her book without having Dr. Markway say everything in this house is off by this number. You know, you don't have that <laughs> long ex expository lecture. You don't need it because we're witnessing them going through it and we're going yeah. through it too with all the weird distortions and feeling slightly off yeah i i think the the cinematography element one of the interesting points too aside from the use of the uh, distorting lens um wise also mentioned the use of infrared photography so he's they filmed this in england 
um, for MGM Studios in, in England. And um, they actually filmed the exterior shots uh, of an English manor house in Warwickshire. Um, I think he said it was about 10 miles away from Stratford-on-Avon, uh, a place called Eddington Park that I think is still there and is a, a hotel now. The mention. Um, it may have been a hotel too while they were filming because I think some of the cast stayed there while they were doing the exterior work. Um, but when he shot the the exterior shots of the mansion itself, which is the image that stays with me from this film, I think more than anything else, are those low angle exterior shots of the house that just make it look like it is a a sinister character, um, dark eyes watching you, you know, looming over you. Um, he sent for infrared film so that he could shoot the house with clouds behind it and the infrared photography using black and white photography could bring out the whiteness of the clouds in contrast to the darkness of the house, which I think is interesting. <laughs> and it, it kind of enhanced the sense that the house is this dark entity, this living thing that's just waiting, waiting to get to. Um, and finally claiming Eleanor is the, the victim uh, at the end as she tries to leave the house. Um, so photographic effects like that uh, get it all of that sense, which, like I think, you, like you said, you get in Shirley Jackson's novel as well in her description of the house. It is like a, it's not just a location. It is like an entity in some way, um, even aside from the, the specific ghosts or personalities that are supposed to be haunting it it is it's it's a living thing um that could represent all kinds of destructive powers and to me that that film the 1963 film really got at that very well um through the use of some of those uh, photographic techniques um we're talking about uh the character of eleanor um, kind of being at the center of this film adaptation, what did you guys make of the various characters in, in this adaptation in comparison to the book? Because we talked about the significant differences of characters in the Netflix series. Um, what do you make of, of the characters in the 1963 film? I mean, I, I think they are, especially the core characters, um, when you look at Eleanor, Julie Harris is Eleanor <laughs> to me. I mean, she embodies everything about the character I knew in the in the book, um, especially going back. But then again, I saw the movie first, so yeah, it's hard to separate that. But when I look at that, I, she just plays the that balance between a woman who is very fragile and um is unsure of herself but at the same time is is very sure that she's going to go out and have an adventure <laughs> um it's so I, I don't even know if that makes sense but she plays it so well that to me it it fits really well and and I I love you know who else I love in this adaptation is the character of Luke because I think he plays that and he embodies that kind of smarminess that <laughs> was written into the book really well too um I mean yeah I, I really th think that those two are the ones who really hit the nail on the head and the rest of them don't deviate that far from the from from the novel I don't think at least in my mind they don't if they do it doesn't bother me as much um but I I think that they really hit the nail on the head with Eleanor and Luke I agree. I, I think Russ Tamblin was just inspired casting <laughs> Luke. <laughs> he was the ideal for the kind of smart-ass uh, skeptic. And he had just come off of playing West Side Story, with, um, uh, which uh, was also directed by Robert Wise. Just, I think that was the movie that he did just prior to The Haunting. Um, so he already had that kind of persona associated with him. Uh, and he played that that aspect of the character so well. But I think another one of my favorite moments in the movie for him is the very end where he gets almost the last line before you get Eleanor's closing monologue um, in voiceover where she has become part of the house. And now she walks with those in the house. 
um, you get him saying the line as he looks at the house, he's finally convinced by all that's happened of the horror of what it is. And he says uh, he's set to inherit the house and he's been looking the whole time at the house through the lens of money. You know, and he wants to make money off of what can I do, uh, sell this part of the house to make money. And he finally says it ought to be burnt to the ground and the ground sown with salt. You know, and that's it. <laughs> like, oh, wow. You know, the, the, the playboy who wants to make money off the house is convinced that this is something that is just an abomination that needs to be erased from the earth. That's just a really convincing, horrific moment. The, he, he is a great character in that film. Well, and you know what? That's interesting. When you, Because going back to what you were talking about with um, getting and wise, speaking with Jackson herself about is there any supernatural element in the house, is when you look at it through Luke's eyes, you see that there was something supernatural because if it had only been Eleanor's story, then we would have walked away wondering, well, was this all just about her kind of extended breakdown that we just witnessed? And is everybody else going to walk off back into their normal lives and think, what a sad time we had with Eleanor in that house, you know, how sad that that happened to her. But because he says those words, that really hits home that, no, something supernatural did occur here, even though we're not going to show it in full effect. You know, something supernatural did happen. And, and I think he becomes a really important character for that reason. And now that I know the backstory of, of getting when he was working on adapting it, I think that makes a whole lot more sense now. Yeah, and, and I think um, Russ Timlin also said in an interview that when he was originally offered the part, he turned it down. He didn't want to do it, but in, he was on contract to MGM, and they pushed him into doing it. And he was ultimately glad that he did because he, he turned it down because when he read the script at first, he misunderstood the importance of that character, he said. He, he did not like the fact that he was the one character who did not seem to have anything to do with the supernatural. He wanted the character also to have some connection with ghosts, but he said he did not at the time understand the primary importance of a character who is a skeptic, who's finally convinced, you know, and how it, it lends credibility to the narrative as a whole. So he ended up being really glad that he took that part. And, and did you know that um, Eddington, park where they filmed it was supposed to be haunted the manor house was supposed to be haunted too had, had you guys read anything about the manor house no but i love that idea <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, Russ, Russ Tamlin even claimed he had an experience with a ghost there um he he uh, said that they were staying there while they were because it, it it was converted into a hotel is an old english manor house was converted into a hotel and they were staying there while they were filming the exterior scenes and he he said there was an old old graveyard on the property um behind the manor house and he tried to go out to it in the middle of the night one night while they had lights on the exterior of the house for doing some exterior shots they had everything lit up and so he was using the lights of the production team to try to guide himself down to this dark cemetery and he's it, it's weird the way he describes it he describes walking backwards towards the cemetery while looking back at the lights um, that are being shine, uh, shown on the house and as he was walking backwards into the grave the graves he said he suddenly felt this like chilling grip on the back of his neck and it freaked him out and he ran back toward the manor house went directly to his room and he said he never told anybody about that experience until he recounted it for um the anniversary dvd that they made it because he he had always he had been the skeptic too about the haunting of the manor house where they were filming and he had been laughing about some of the content of uh, the story of the film too and so he felt ashamed too ashamed to tell anybody that he had experienced an actual haunting while they were filming it so the the place that they shot it at was very atmospheric i think conducive to the storyline too um i agree with what you guys are saying about julie harris as as eleanor i can't imagine anybody else being a better eleanor to me 
Um, and her vo- her work with voiceover in that film is also wonderful. Voiceover is so tricky. Sometimes it can get really annoying and give too much exposition. But I think her voiceover was really well written and well delivered to get us into the mind of a woman, uh, like Lisa said, who's like caught between this push for independence and also the fear of of breaking free of the the past domestic life that she was imprisoned by. And I think that Julie Harris really got, got at that role very well. It may in part too be because she was suffering from some depression while she was filming the movie. Um, she admitted that herself. And then uh, the actors who work with her said that she was really standoffish. Um, so the, the actor who played Dr. Markway and uh, then Russ Tamblin and Claire Bloom, who played Theo, uh, they said they all three kind of hung out together when they weren't filming and and she wouldn't hang out with them. Uh, so she seemed kind of isolated while she was working on the film, too. And that may have played a lot into that character. Uh, what did what did you guys make of Claire Bloom as Theo? That was an, I think it was a really striking performance in that film. How do you how do you uh, feel about the interpretation of Theo's character? I liked, I mean, I don't know, I feel like when I think of Theo, I think more of her than even now if you're watching the Netflix version and the very good, you know, portrayal of of Theo there. I know she just is the second she was on the screen, she kind of reminded me of Theo, you know, talking over Mrs. Dudley's strange monologue. Um, They used, uh, you know, the interior monologue of Eleanor to show that Theo has some psychic ability um, if you didn't have, you know, the Eleanor's thoughts being spoken, it wouldn't have made any sense when Theo, you know, says something that, that Eleanor has been thinking, which I thought was an interesting way of dealing with that. Yeah. Um, I thought the use of mirrors when Eleanor and Theo were around was really interesting. There are some scenes where you just see them reacting to what's going on through, you know, reflections of theirs and mirrors. I did think, you know, in the book... In the book, Theo's sexuality is left is is pretty ambiguous. But I think when you're reading it, it's clear because of the way that she avoids some answers to questions of Eleanor that that she's most likely a, a lesbian, most likely lives with a woman, and that's the direction that they went in with the Netflix episode. In the movie, you know, you have that scene where Eleanor actually kind of like, well, she doesn't kind of she she calls Theo out like she in the yeah. book Eleanor's always going you know, she wants to live with Theo at the end of the book. But yeah. in the movie, she dismisses Theo pretty harshly, you know, saying she's unnatural, uh, you know, saying that she's a mistake and basically that she like, shouldn't exist. So you, know, you have Theo kind of wanting some sort of relationship with Eleanor in the movie. And, and this is a movie came out in 1963, but Eleanor pretty much like cuts that off so that she could keep pursuing Markway and this, I guess, more, like it's a romance, you know, with a capital R that she's in a, to try to end up with him, even though Mrs. Markway is about to show up. But I thought that jolt there, like not letting the love triangle keep playing, not letting Theo and Eleanor have that connection was an interesting choice that they made there, cutting that off. Yeah, I think it was, it was, seemed like it was in part motivated by the culture of the period. I mean, um, Getting and Wise both said that they intended for the character to be seen as lesbian, um, and they wrote her that way. And in fact, they wrote a, a Getting wrote a, a scene in the screenplay that they later cut out um, of Theo breaking up with her former female lover at her apartment before she goes to Hill House, and they decided that, to cut it out because they felt that the relationship between um, uh, Theo and Eleanor was strong enough to carry the implications of her lesbianism without having to include a scene that, that was that was that explicit. Um, but uh, the what you're mentioning the the uh, the reworking of the relationship between Eleanor and Theo from the novel, uh, where they seem to be really connecting the novel and Eleanor wants to have a home, have a life, and have that connection with Theo that she hasn't been able to have with other people. Um, because of her stunted life serving her her horrible mother. Um, in the movie, I think that change that they make where they emphasize the the romantic connection with Markway 
is interesting for the time period. Um, they they transform Dr. Montague from the novel, who is an older dude, I think, in the novel. You have to correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't read the novel in maybe three years. Um, but I think he's like an older guy. Um, in the movie, uh, Richard Johnson, the actor playing him, is young, handsome, um, dashing. Uh, he's constantly complimenting Eleanor, you know, about your natural beauty. Oh, how how could you be so pretty in the morning after this terrible haunting event? <laughs> you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. It was like, okay, <laughs> dude, you're married, you know, and, and you've got this, this fragile woman here that you know has been locked away for 11 years, you know, has just escaped her horrible mother. And you're you're not realizing that the way you're behaving isn't appropriate, you know. And I think he's deliberately cast that way, played that way, written that way to bring to highlight a kind of romantic potential, the heteronormative romantic potential between Eleanor and Dr. Markway. Because right. and, and this is just my theory, is because I think when the film was made in 1963, we're at the beginning of second wave feminism here, and we're, I think what they're doing is they're taking the gender dynamics of Shirley Jackson's novel, and they're simplifying them to kind of match what was going on in the developing feminist movement um, in the United States at the time, where you have the focus not necessarily on the overall skewed family dynamics of the Crane family in the house and and the abusive mother that Eleanor lived with, but instead you get a focus on abusive patriarchy. That seems to me to be the film's focus. They rework Hill House itself to focus on all its um, patriarchal imagery. You know, the phallic tower, the library, even the nursery is turned into a prison for the, the female children by the father, Hugh Crane. In that movie, they have a scene in the beginning, a prologue of the, the film, that shows um, Hugh Crane built the house to kind of incarcerate his wives and daughter. And he uses the heart of Hill House, the nursery, as a place of incarceration for his daughter, where she lives her whole life and dies there. Um, and it, it, the whole focus of the movie seems to be on patriarchy destroying women. You know, the, the maternal aspects of the house that also have uh, power in Jackson's novel seem to be taken, to, uh, ignored. In the film, and I think it's because of the time period, because of the focus on um, the destructiveness of patriarchy in women's lives the, with the second wave feminism, and so you transform that love affair thing between Eleanor and Dr. Markway to something where it's this another male who is dominating her and going to mess her up because he, he doesn't really understand what's going on with her. And then you have her claimed by the house, which seems to be primarily a Hugh Crane type power at the end um, through a competition with Dr. Markway's wife. Uh, that was interesting what they did with, bringing in Dr. Markway's wife at the end. She's very different from Dr. Montague's wife in the novel. And Mel, you mentioned this at the beginning of the episode. What did you make of the conclusion of the film whenever they bring in Mrs. Markway? You said that that kind of threw you off. What, what were you talking about there? Oh, when I first watched the movie after reading the book, it, it kind of threw me off because, well, one, you, having Mar Markway be much younger and an option for um, Eleanor kind of threw me off. Eleanor In the book, Eleanor kind of looks at Dr. Montague, well, all three of the young people look at Dr. Montague almost like this weird father figure. Yeah. Um, so making him the romantic interest, I thought was, you know, an interesting change. Um and then having her in competition with Mrs. Markway for Markway kind of threw me off because in the book, in the book, Mrs. Montague is completely different. Mrs. Montague is obsessed with the supernatural uh, to the point where she, she, um, uh, she, uh, she's kind of like a tele, these mediums you see on television, maybe uh, doing ghost hunting, I guess. So Dr. Montague is <laughs> trying to find out rational uh, explanations and use data and take notes and all this blah, blah, that doesn't work. Um, and she comes in and is basically like, come to the light, you know, <laughs> it's like, all we have to do is love dead people and they won't hurt us. You know, nobody ever gets injured. You just talk to them using your Ouija board 
and use your spirit control and everything is fine. And she wants to sleep in the most haunted room so she can experience the ghost. So they're just, they're two supernatural investigators, but doing things really differently. So I, I felt like they were completely changing the end of the book to make Mark way that focus and make the wife also a victim. I felt like we didn't know the wife long enough. Like she just pops in and then all of a sudden she's in terror for her life. But then when I thought about it a little bit, and I think I actually had a conversation with you about it, um, <laughs> I walked back away from the cliff and I was like, okay, yes, I still think that she is not developed as a character. I still think she's thrown in as this weird like thing at the end. But I understand I understand what you're saying. And I and I'm I'm thinking along those lines now that there's got if you're going to have Eleanor completely repudiate Theo because you're trying to show the destruction of this woman in particular, but also just women in this house starts with the death of the wife ends with Eleanor. Yeah. Um, hitting the same tree and the same gash. Yeah. And everything. <laughs> um, in a way, if you're looking for like a romantic idea, if you're, if you're looking for a, you were talking about heteronormativity, then play, making the wife also like, you know, making Mark way prey on Eleanor and then like, Oh, look, I have a wife knowing yeah. the nursery is evil knowing that people have been in prison in the nursery before allowing his wife to stay in there. Yeah. Yeah. Now looking now watching it again, I'm like, Oh man, like this deepens Mark Way's character because Montague in the book is partially responsible for Eleanor's issue because he doesn't pay attention to women. He doesn't care what women yeah. have to say. And he thinks they're too emotional. Um, Montague in the Netflix haunting of Hill house played by Russ Hamlin um, <laughs> is just as, as kind of messed up because he's not listening to truly what Nell's issue is. It just sends her back to the house because he thinks it's harmless. But in Mark way in this movie, there's something like even more like dangerous about him, yeah. whether he realizes what he's doing or not by manipulating and preying upon these women and putting the two women in competition for him. You're right. At the end, it's all about the how. Like they transfer the competition over Markway to the house because Eleanor yeah. keeps saying it's not Mrs. Markway. The house wants the house wants me. Mrs. Yeah. Markway will be safe if she chooses me. So it's like, well, I can't be with Markway. Journeys didn't end in lovers meeting. I'm gonna have the house. Yeah. And so maybe she chooses you know, Ukraine. You know. Yeah, yeah she yeah. chooses Ukraine, right? Instead of Theo <laughs> and and Luke or anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, in the novel, I think it's interesting you mentioned the, the end of the novel where she's um, she goes to the library in the tower following her mother's voice in the novel. Um, and you have the walls in the novel of the house bleed with kind of minstrel blood, you know, uh, in which the words are written, help Eleanor come home. You have the nursery, um, it's a kind of womb-like nursery. So all of those things are transformed, I think, in Wise's film version to take on much more patriarchal connotations that are ominous for destruction of Eleanor. Because in, instead of following her mom's voice into the tower in the library, she is dancing with Hugh Crane. So you remember she starts dancing in front of that large statue that they uh, take to be Hugh Crane. Um, is surrounded as a statue of big statue of a man in the conservatory surrounded by statues of like subservient females. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I think they originally say it's like, it's supposed to be the statue of St. Francis healing the lepers or something like that. But they all interpret it as being actually Hugh Crane making a statue to himself, you know, with all the women that he's destroyed gathered around him. And she goes and dances before Hugh Crane and then dances into the library the location of that uh, where they found that horrible book that he created for his daughter, um, you know, telling her to uh, uh, bow to her father and how she was going to burn in hell. You know, she didn't <laughs> she didn't obey her father. Um, so the, the emphasis, it seems to be, is on the power, just of the destructive power of the males, of, of the dad, the patriarch. And kind of Markway seems to be kind of the dashing you know, uh, seductive aspect of, of that character type. And I think that when Mrs. Uh, it's interesting, the, the role that Mrs. Markway plays in the death of Eleanor is that when Eleanor is trying to, or is trying to, they're trying to force Eleanor to leave the house at the end. Um, after she goes into the library, climbs the uh, staircase and nearly uh, falls off the staircase to the top that Dr. Markway claims he realizes she's too fragile, you know, to stay in this house. So they're going to send her away for her own good. She doesn't want to go. 
she wants to stay because she feels that the house really wants her. And she's jealous that the house has claimed Mrs. Markway instead of her. Mrs. Markway slept in the nursery and then vanished mysteriously. And the implication is that Hugh Crane in the house, you know, took her or whatever in Eleanor's place because it couldn't get Eleanor. And Eleanor wants to be the object of the house's desire. And so the the patriarchal house becomes this site of rivalry between the two women. And as Eleanor is being cast out of the house at the end and she's driving away, you're going to have to tell me what you think about this alteration in the conclusion. Um, we see the house in the frame behind her through the rear window of her vehicle as she's driving away. The house is looking at her ominously. She's going away. She's not wanting to leave. And then suddenly it seems like a, a, a ghostly force wrests control of the steering wheel from her. The steering wheel actually moves without her moving it. And she thinks for a moment that the house is going to bring her back, but then the ghostly force seems to lead the, the car into an oncoming tree. And just before she's going to hit that tree, Mrs. Markway suddenly runs across the path of the car, almost like a ghost herself, because she's wearing a white nightgown. And you get her in this black and white photography. She fleets by in front of the car. It causes the car to seemingly veer and crash into the tree where the first Mrs. Crane was killed, whenever Hugh Crane brought her to the house for the first time that he built as her her prison, basically. <laughs> and so it, if Mrs. Markway then is this, used as this pawn it's like it's almost like the house is playing women off against each other do you do you get that feeling too i mean M M mrs montague didn't have that role in the book right mel you might remember the ending of the book better than i do because i in my mind I don't know that that ending scared me so badly that as you were describing it I was just getting like images flashing through my head and now I can't think of the book in <laughs> the book's ending um that was such a scary scene <laughs> like it was such a scary scene the idea I I have I have real this this movie hits on a lot of real issues for me just kind of real talk here <laughs> because <laughs> things that scare me irrationally that really shouldn't scare me like staircases have always frightened me um and we haven't even talked about the the shots like looking down from the top of the spiral staircase um is is enough to make my palms sweaty just just imagining that in my head like the the staircase but also any any time machines can kind of move on their own or act of their own accord so when the st I remember the steering wheel <laughs> you know, <laughs> moving on its own and I had almost forgotten that Mrs. Markway had run out but you're right she does run out kind of like a ghost you know this ghostly figure running out in front of the car and and then it, it, it's all over kind of very quickly but it, how did the book end because I I think, isn't Eleanor's death in the book more ambiguous? And she's driving away from the car, or from the house. She aims her car at the tree. Isn't this right? And she, um, she says something like, I'm really doing I'm this. I'm really doing it. I'm, I'm really doing it. And then she, what did right. she say right before that? Uh, right after that. Which, I'm, why am says, I doing Why am this? I doing yeah. this? That, yeah, there's a, there's a change. Why don't they stop me? Yeah, why yeah. don't they mm -hmm. stop me? That's it. So she, yeah, so you get the idea of, it, it's still a very ambiguous ending of, is she, is she really acting of her own accord or, or not? Or is she still under the effect of the house when she's doing that? Yeah, you're right. Okay. And the movie seems well, even, to make it explicit that the house <laughs> takes control at that moment. You know, she's right. wanting to go back to the house, but it seems like a supernatural force actually wrests control of the steering wheel from her so that it's not her active agency deciding to kill herself to stay there. It's more like the house claiming her. And the fact that it threw Mrs. Markway in front of her after the house had claimed Mrs. Markway to kind of push the car off course also seemed like is the house has this agency that I don't know that it fully has in the novel. I don't know. What were you going to say, Mel? <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that it seems like 
I still think you can maybe see some ambiguity, ambiguity, I can't even say the word right now, ambiguity in the end of uh, the movie, because we don't know why Mrs. Markway was there, though I do think you can interpret the house as kind of throwing her in front of the car. But uh, I think the house rests control of Eleanor in in both the book and the movie. That's kind of where I fall. But in the movie, I think it's kind of clear that something else is going on because she keeps, if I remember right, let's see, I rewatched the movie last week. I think at the end, she's basically kind of like, go away, Eleanor, go away. You know, just like in the book, making fun of them, saying like, you may think I'm leaving now, but you can't make me go away, that idea. But then like they show the steering wheel moving, uh, you actually visually see the steering wheel jerking her all around and she's trying not to hit things. Yeah. Like she's not yeah. trying to crash and kill herself. That's um, when she starts to protest. Cause before that she's yeah. wanting to go back. She's wanting the house to claim her. And then suddenly when it actually does, she's like, no, no, stop. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like fighting with whatever it is, you know, whereas in the book, while I do think that in the end, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why don't they stop me? It's almost, it's, I read that in the book is almost like her waking up from like a possession or something, you know, Ooh. like that, that she's, she's just like, holy crap. Like <laughs> I didn't really want to do this. Like something else was there. That's kind of how I read it. Um, and then she's outside the house. So if she dies, she doesn't get anything she wanted, right? Whatever walk there walked alone. So yeah. it's not Eleanor. Eleanor is gone. Um, in the movie, though, I think that visual of the steering wheel, which I know is terrifying, Lisa, for me as well. I have dreams about steering wheels falling <laughs> off while I'm driving. Yes, um, me too. <laughs> and I'm pounding non-existent brakes while the steering wheel flies off. Yeah. So you see the steering wheel moving on her. So I think it's pretty clear that the house is like attacking her at that point. But Mrs. Markway, I, I've i never been sure in my own mind if Mrs. Markway isn't just like running out like, ah, you know, over yeah. court. but then I, you know, Mrs. Markway irritates the heck out of me. We know that. Um, <laughs> but I could totally see the house having caused her because she claims the house confused her. She claims yeah. that she got confused and because of doors opening and closing and being, you know, kind of weirded out by the house that she was lost. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like the the wheel turning is more clearly taken, is something taking control of Eleanor in the movie. But the Mrs. Markway, I go back and forth on whether the house was actually trying to figure that out. Um, but I'm I mean, does the house the... not care what victim it gets? I mean, would it have been double points for the house if she had run over Markway and hit the tree? <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, I'm just just kind of confused at that. (laughs) But but what you mentioned about the tree being the tree where the first Mrs. Crane was killed, too. Is that the same in the novel? I don't remember that in the novel. Is is that a fabrication of the film? She I'm pretty sure in the novel she died. She was brought lifeless into the house in the novel. And I'm pretty sure it's because her carriage overturned. I think it hit a tree because then Mark uh, Montague, sorry, we're talking about the book now. And then Montague tells them that if they leave in the night, he refuses to let them leave at night because the last person who left at night crashed into a tree. Like they ran their horse into a tree. Okay. Um, So so, it's not quite as explicit though. Right. It, yeah. But it's still that kind of repetition of crashing in the drive. That's what kills yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, mean, I think what's yeah. interesting at the end of the film is that Mark West specifically points out the the gash on the tree itself where Mrs. Yeah. Crane's carriage hit it and it killed her. And, it, and again, it's like to me and that's another woman victim claimed by ukraine you know that's what it's- yeah that's what i was just thinking instead of tree rings it's like look at all these gashes these women who have died in this driveway well i guess we're gonna go home now um yeah and i think the fact that everybody is the everybody in the book and in the movie is dying outside the house too except for uh the companion uh who hangs herself off the spiral staircase and uh the daughter who dies of old age in the house other i mean other than the companion committing suicide there is not a lot of violent death you know in the book like the ghost you could make the argument that there are no ghosts in the book though i i don't i don't i agree with shirley jackson that there are but i mean there's evidence you know scholars have talked about it in articles and i think it's in ruth franklin's bio that the you know the editors wanted jackson to make more like where are the ghosts in this book (laughs) (laughs) 
there's a couple of spots where she wrote letters and wrote, and I quote, there's going to be some dandy ghosts in this book. And then at the end, even she admitted it's not cl- clear. I mean, there's not like, here's, you know, Mrs. Crane and here's Bob. And I mean, there, you know, I mean, you read the whole book and it's terrifying and there's evidence there are ghosts, but they're not like ghost ghosts. Yeah. Um, and so I've always thought the the people dying outside of the house is more like interpreting the house as some gesture toward home, but it's not a yeah. home. It's a house yeah. and it's going to kill you. And it's also going to expel you. You like, you don't even get to stay in the house and be Casper. Like you're gone. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I and, and so having the two women outside the house, I think plays right into that. Yeah. It's, it's like a, a symbol of family home of everything that could be dysfunctional and destructive about, about domesticity. <laughs> Right, it's the nightmare is the family, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, The one one haunting that they omitted from this movie that I found so compelling in Jackson's novel is this, and they omitted it because it was an exterior scene, interestingly enough, and and, uh, Nelson Giddings said that they wanted to keep most of the horror elements focus on the interior of the house. Most of the horror scenes and the haunting scenes happen inside the house in the film. But in the book, there's that scene where I think Eleanor and Theo are like taking a walk outside in a garden or something, a wall garden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the ghost family. Yeah. Yeah. And their puppy. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, they see see this family having a picnic and whatever. They look so happy. And there's this (laughs) beaming mother at the center of it. She looks at them. And they just turn tail and run for the gate. And they are like clawing at the walls of the garden and the gate to try to get the hell out of there. I just think that that, the horror of a a woman's reaction of of that kind of horror to a scene of what should be the domestic idol just speaks volumes about what that novel is saying about domesticity. And that that didn't appear in the film at all. I don't know if it was a loss or not, but that was one of my favorite ghostly scenes um, in the novel. It, it, weirdly, weirdly terrifying. Happy picnic. Yeah. Disneyland turned into horror film. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair to Theo and Eleanor, I, all the color seeped out of their world. That they were the trees became white. <laughs> on this black. And then there was this then you family. would want to get family. the hell out of there. <laughs> I would have been running before the family started moving, but that's just me. <laughs> so what do you guys think about this film in comparison to the Netflix series? Well, you know, what's really interesting is talking about the idea of adaptation. And we've been talking about the Netflix series as an adaptation of Shirley Jackson's novel, but we probably haven't talked about it enough as an adaptation also of the film version, The Haunting. Because, you know, when you look at it, like I, I pulled up some stills from the movie. And, and one of them I have pulled up here is that dancing scene that you're talking about. Um, and where she's kind of going around this. And of course, they have that. They recreated, you know, pretty closely the whole conservatory and the statues. And of course, the... the spiral staircase (laughs) you know they recreated that to really great effect um but one of the the interesting things is even down to like the movement when I think it's in episode five the bit neck lady when we get um kind of Nell's story coming at least to one type of clothes (laughs) um when she comes in and she's dancing in the house and yes she is also wearing a very similar kind of sheer white sheer old-fashioned nightgown which we talked about in one of our patreon mini episodes we talked about the costuming of hill house um but you know it it absolutely goes back to robert wise's the haunting here and and what he did with that scene Um, um that's a complete callback that's an adaptation of the movie not the book um which is really fascinating because in that way adaptation becomes a really uh, really a living thing it is 
it's a cumulative, like a cumulative hypertext where you, one text plays on another and another. And a, a filmmaker who's making an adaptation of something that's been adapted before not only has the original literary source, but all the other adaptations that went prior to that, as well as all other kinds of cultural products that they could reference to as well. Um, that's why, I, to me, adaptation is it's just like you said, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating process because it keys into interpretations of literary text that went before in film, uh, in culture. Um, it, it bridges past and present where you're taking a past text into the present and, and viewing it through maybe a contemporary cultural lens, maybe for the 1963 haunting, some of the changes more relevant to a society that was moving into second wave feminism. Um, you know, maybe we're in a third wave or post feminist time periods more relevant to some of the changes that you see in, um, the haunting of Hill house on Netflix. Um, the 1999 film version also had significant changes in Eleanor's character that I think are really relevant to what was going on in terms of, um, gender dynamics and, uh, the feminist movement in the nineties. Uh, so it's like it's adaptation becomes this living, breathing thing where a literary text lives on and is re-envisioned and reformed throughout different periods and in different societies, keeping it relevant to different cultures. And that's in part, I think, why literary works um, tend to spike in sales whenever an adaptation is popular is if people go back to the original and then they see it in dialogue with the new work that they were looking at. I, I just love thinking about the, those di extended dialogues that get carried on between literary sources and the various other artworks that, that they inspire. And that's one of the reasons why I really appreciated the series that you guys have been doing on the, the uh, Netflix adaptations that thought all the changes they made in something that's so loose um, were fascinating to me. So it's, I really enjoyed those episodes, guys. <laughs> well thank you we really enjoyed doing them <laughs> mainly because we love Shirley Jackson so much I think. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think that the the people who made that series you could tell that they did too I mean for all mm -hmm. of it, it's a loose loose adaptation it seemed to be informed by a pretty good grounding knowledge of her work um, and an appreciation and a respect for her work, which a, a lot of times people think that if an adaptation doesn't have, if it's not faithful, you know, the term of fidelity that we demand an adaptation be faithful to the source text, that somehow it's disrespecting that text. I, I think that it can be faithful or respectful of the source text while making really significant changes. I think a loose adaptation can be just as respectful and, and just as fulfilling as a a really close adaptation. And so, so to me, the Netflix series and the 1963 haunting that are on two different ends of the spectrum, one of them really close and one of them really loose, um, are, are, are wonderful interplay with Jackson's original novel. And to me, the dialogue between the original work and those very different works um, just enhances the, the original for me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, part of the fun of watching the Netflix, The Haunting of Hill House, beyond just the amazing story, is realizing that, you know, and I think we came to this conclusion when we ended our series on it, Lisa, I don't know, you can, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of the themes that we were talking about with the Netflix version of The Haunting of Hill House, while dealt with in very different ways, were themes that were dealt with in The Haunting of Hill House written in 1959, that we just keep going around these gender issues and these issues of motherhood and these issues of family and these issues of home um, over and over again. I mean, I think like what you were saying earlier, Sherry, these adaptations say more about us as a culture when they're coming out sometimes and they do like if you're being true to a work or something like that yeah um and then the other half of that is just I you know once I got into the Netflix version of The Haunting of Hill House I loved 
seeing for my own self, but also looking up stuff online and people who just caught Jackson stuff, like child Theo reading the lottery in the background, you know, yeah. <laughs> wanting to name Luke Robin, which I'm like, do you guys realize how evil Robin was in the bird's nest? Come on. <laughs> and like, I mean, just all this stuff where you're like, somebody really read a lot of Jackson yeah. and really loved it in order to throw all these seeds uh, throughout this and make something so beautiful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, re- I enjoyed this idea of thinking of these two works that are so very different in conjunction with the original work. So I'm I'm glad that you guys chose chose to do this. <laughs> well, I think that this might be a good place for us to wrap this up. Uh, this is a great conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Sherry, for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Thanks. This has been wonderful. <laughs> well, we're going to have to come up with a way to get you back here uh, in the future. <laughs> we'll come up uh, with something. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We will be in touch. <clears throat> so before we finish up here, there's just a reminder that we'd like to pass on, listeners. Uh, remember, your co-host, Lisa and I, Mel, uh, wrote a book. From gothic ghost stories to psychological horror to science fiction, women have been the primary architects of dark speculative literature of all sorts. Satisfy your craving for extraordinary authors and exceptional fiction. Meet the women writers who defied convention to craft some of literature's strangest tales in Monster She Wrote, a new nonfiction book. <clears throat> the book will be released September 17th, but you can pre-order now by going to the Cork Books website or through any major book reta- retailer. And of course, we'd love to hear from you, our listeners. We're at No Fear Cast at, on Twitter and Instagram, and we also have a Facebook page. If you'd like to contact us by email, and we do love getting emails, send us an email at nofearcast at gmail.com. If you love what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon and get access to exclusive content. Or simply rate and review us, which is entirely free, and helps us tremendously by helping other listeners find us. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.